Interesting to see what they go. Let's get back to last night. Mac Jones, very familiar with Mercedes-Benz Stadium after playing there in his college days. Early second quarter, Pats up 3-0 in the red zone. Jones finding Nelson Aguilar wide open over the middle. Runs in for the 19-yard TD. Pats up 10 to nothing. But the New England defense was really the story of this one. Next, Falcons possession, third and one on the New England 14. Matt Ryan sacked by Kyle Van Noy for a big 13-yard loss. Atlanta would miss the 50-yard field goal attempt. Just under five. Five minutes left in the fourth quarter. New England's defense still hot. Atlanta down 16. Ryan throws. The pass is intercepted by J.C. Jackson. That's his sixth interception of the year. Patriots would kick a field goal going up 19 to nothing. Next Atlanta possession. Josh Rosen in a quarterback. Well, Van Noy takes care of that. He takes it back for a pick six with the interception. Pats win 25 to nothing. Here's Patriots cornerback J.C. Jackson after the game. I don't want to brag too much, but... I feel like we got, we got one of the best defenses in, in, in the league right now. I feel like we played great defensively. We didn't give up no touchdowns, no points allowed. I mean, it don't, it don't get no better than that. Defense played outstanding. Like, I can't even describe, like, but we got to keep, keep it up. It's, it's going to get scary. It's going to be scary. I don't want to brag, but like I do want to brag. <laughs> We've usually seen the Pats D use physical man-to-man -man coverage. Last night against Atlanta, they played zone 81% of the time. Their highest in a game since tracking began in 2016. After using zone at the lowest rate in the league the first six weeks, the Pats have really changed their identity, doing so at the ninth highest rate in the league during the five-game win streak while allowing the second lowest yards per drop back in QBR. So they've proven that they can adjust, which maybe is the most impressive thing at this point but Marcus what impresses you most about this Patriots defense oh god it's the multiplicity what doesn't impress me about what the New England Patriots are doing defensively they got two guys on the edge that's starting to ascend in Kyle Van Noy and we talked about Matthew Judon and the way he's been able to get after the quarterback they're stout in the center with Devon Godshaw and company. You talk about the second level with Hightower, his experience, Bentley, and then on the back end. Listen, it's time for us to start having the conversation about J.C. Jackson being a top three corner in this league. They are so well disciplined. Everybody understands where they need to be. But the most important thing the New England Patriots have from a defensive standpoint, they can rush the passer with four. And the pressure still works. Yep. So they have multiplicity. They can determine whatever type of game plan, whatever type of scheme. El Boogie, you mentioned it. They go zone. They go heavy man. And they feel comfortable no matter what they're trying to deploy. That's the sign of a really good defense and a really good football team. And they're doing it at the highest level right now. Yeah, 100%. And they also have Bill Belichick. I mean, Bill Belichick has been in the kitchen wrist flipping like a stir fry. I mean, he's cooking like Quavo, Offset, and Takeoff are in the kitchen with him. And, you look, he, and, and it's, really, it's really cool to listen to Marcus talk about multiplicity, right? And I know Mean is going to have some more to add as we go throughout the show. But the one thing Marcus mentioned was the ability to rush. That's why you can play zone now. That's why you don't have to play as much man. You don't have to bring five. You don't have to bring six. We don't have to do one dogs we don't have to give away what we're going to be playing from the snap and what they do as well is they disguise so out of those disguises they drop and they're making quarterbacks figure out things on the rush and when you have guys like Matthew Judon when you have guys like Kyle Van Noy, just a little hesitation just a little indecisiveness can cause pressure and that's mm -hmm. what we're seeing from the New England Patriots and they are finishing whether it's JC Jackson whether it's Devin McCourty whoever's in the backfield when they get opportunities to make plays on the ball we are watching this this team do it. This is one of the best defenses in the NFL, and they are following the trend that most Bill Belichick teams follow. They are getting better as the year gets on. Uh, Nico said yeah, this morning always. that Bill Belichick always says the season starts after Thanksgiving. Well, it looks like they're ramping up for that time, and they're ready to eat. Yeah, Ryan, you're, exa you're exactly right, and I think it's especially true given the fact that this defense is so different from the one we saw last year. You yeah. draft pick picks like Christian Barmore coming yeah. online, looking fantastic. Mm. I mean, so dominant in the middle. And then free agent signings like Judon, guys, guys like Van Noy coming back. So, of course, naturally, it would take time not only for this unit to gel, but also for Bill Belichick to figure out how best to use them. Marcus, you, you talked about the standard pass rush. Something that jumped out to me last night, they only blitzed Matt Ryan on 11% of dropbacks. 11, yeah, got pressure yeah, yeah. 31%. 
That's not usually something that happens. I'll like the combination of those two numbers is spectacular. And last week, y'all, we talked about the Patriots defense, and I said they might be a top five unit. I think I might have been underselling them. I mean, this Ooh. should be in the conversation for the best defense in the league. I, I, I feel yeah. like I feel comfortable saying that, frankly. Uh, Mina, have we? El Boogie. Oh, go ahead. Oh. You know what's so cool about this, y'all, is that as much as we talk about offenses and how much they spread you out and spread you thin, this is vintage New England defense. Mm. This is the way it's been. This is the way he's deployed defense. We talk about his, his scheme concepts and how he could change game in and game out. He went out in free agency and, and, and got guys to emulate vintage New England Patriots defense. That's why I'm excited about it. Mina, did we ever figure out a good nickname for Matthew Judon? I kind of liked yours already, but I know you threw it out there for the oh, fans. Anybody sweet. got something? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I went with old red sleeves last week, and I have not heard anything better. I would like for him to do a green New sleeve England, for Christmas. Twitter, oh, I guess that's probably a little so Twitter, festive. <laughs> Mina, New England Twitter actually uses red sleeves. When they when they said that he yeah, broke, call uh, his own sack record, they call him red sleeves. So that you oh, should be credited with that. Oh, red sleeves. And by the way, we're talking about the defense, but this Matt Jones is, so is now five and zero this season on the road. He joins Dak Prescott and Big Ben as the only other rookies in NFL history to win each of their first five career road starts. It's been impressive. Let's bring in Field Yates for the latest on the injury report heading into the rest of Week Eleven. Field, we've got some news for Cowboys Chiefs. What do you know? Yeah, not good news here for Dallas, Laura, as they have placed wide receiver Amari Cooper on the reserve COVID nineteen list. He is out for Sunday's game against the. Kansas City Chiefs. Now, if there is good news for Dallas, is that their depth at wide receiver is exceptional. You can expect more Michael Gallup on Sunday, but Amari Cooper out this week and potentially next week as well. Of course, Dallas always plays on Thanksgiving afternoon. Meanwhile, the Ravens are going to have their quarterback, Lamar Jackson, who actually missed time due to a non COVID illness for the fourth separate occasion this season. He missed both Wednesday and Thursday practice. He was back on Friday. He is good to go. Of course, they play the Bears on Sunday and a depleted Bears defense at that. Alvin Kamara unlikely to play on Sunday for the New Orleans Saints. Missed practice on Thursday. Missed practice again on Friday. Would not be surprised if by the time this show is over, he has been ruled out for this game against the Philadelphia Eagles. It would mean more Mark Ingram on Sunday. He was really good last week for New Orleans, as you might expect. And then... Finally, some good running back news is the Browns are going to have Nick Chubb back in action on Sunday. He was activated from the reserve COVID-19 list earlier today. He missed last week's game against the New England Patriots. He will be available on Sunday in a game which they're heavily favored against the Detroit Lions. Yeah, listen, uh, they'll be very glad to have Nick Chubb back. Field, you're also following another story. What's the latest on Antonio Brown in Tampa? A unique story here that was originally reported by the Tampa Bay Times yesterday, Laura, which in which the former personal chef for Antonio Brown alleges that the Bucks wide receiver obtained a fake COVID-19 vaccination card. Originally, Brown, according to the personal chef, actually asked his personal chef for help in obtaining a card in exchange for cash. That did not come to fruition as Brown later informed him he had received a vaccination card somehow otherwise. Now, the Bucks have made it clear that they were 100% vaccinated and they have followed NFL protocols here. The lawyer for Antonio Brown in a statement to ESPN's Jenna Lane, who covers the Bucks, says that Brown is vaccinated, going so far as to say if anybody would like to see Brown receive the booster shot, not only would Brown oblige, he would do so on live TV. So we'll follow this one. The NFL has begun its process of looking into these allegations from Antonio Brown's former personal chef. But as you know, Laura, there are not there are several people that have looked to in various corners to try to acquire a fake COVID vaccination card. Brown's personal chef or former personal chef alleges he is somebody that has tried that. We'll see where this one ends up with the NFL. Yeah, a wild story to follow. Brown has also missed the Bucks' last three games due to an ankle injury. We've got a whole lot more NFL Live coming your field. Let's start with the latest status of this game and multiple players that we're looking into begin with DeAndre Hopkins. Yeah, he's actually going to be unavailable for the Cardinals on Sunday, oh. Laura. Head coach Cliff Kingsbury said earlier this afternoon, no DeAndre Hopkins as he has been dealing with that hamstring injury for several weeks now. It happened, actually, he started the game, did not 
finish a game on Thursday night football. He has been out since that time, so there will not be any DeAndre Hopkins on the field in Seattle on Sunday. But it sounds like there's a good chance they will have their quarterback, Kyler Murray, who has returned to practice this week on a limited basis all week, but seems to be trending in the right direction. He is going to be called a game-time decision, but this sounds like a game-time decision with optimism, Laura, as he has been trending in the right direction after missing the past two games. The Cardinals got off to a hot start with Colt McCoy as their quarterback two weeks ago, and then it caught up to them against Carolina last week. Sounds like they will have Kyler against the Seahawks on Sunday in an important NFC West matchup. Yeah, they've been conservative with Kyler's recovery, and, and maybe that's going to end up being the right decision when you look back on it. But, Mina, what are you watching for as a matchup in this Seattle Cardinals game? Well, I'm looking to see if Seattle can bounce back from a pretty dismal showing offensively. Um, well, ideally, Russell Wilson's a little bit healthier than he was last week. But for me, in this particular matchup, as much as Wilson has struggled on third down for a while now, I actually think how the Seahawks offense performs in their game planning on first down will go a long way towards determining whether they have success in this game. Because the Cardinals defense is extremely aggressive on first down. They actually blitz 40% of the time, which is the second most in the NFL. They're aggressive against the pass, they're aggressive against the run. And Seattle has not only struggled running the ball on first down, they have really struggled with screens, which would be typically what you lean on to neutralize that. So I'll be curious to see what their game plan is coming into this game, expecting a Cardinals pass rush on first down, whether they can neutralize that and try to get to third and manageable, which would make things a lot easier for Russell Wilson. Yeah, the Seahawks are currently last place in the NFC West. And Mina, as you know, they have not finished last place in their division since 1996. So we'll see if they can end up gaining up a little bit of ground there. Sorry, Mina, I had to do it. All right, let's go to Tampa Bay. They're looking to turn things around with some home field advantage after losing back-to-back -back games on the road. The Bucks, who host the Giants on Monday Night Football, averaging 40 and a half points per game and are 4-0 at home. Here's Gronk on if we'll see him this week. I want to help out the guys. I want to get out there, make some plays like I was at the beginning of the year, uh, get some first downs, get some touchdowns, uh, just help out the offense uh, throughout the game. Um, and, and that's my goal. I mean, we're taking it one step at a time. I mean, I just got two good practices under my belt, um, and that's that's a big step right there. That's, that's the first, you know, crucial steps um, is getting some practices under my belt um, and, and making sure that I feel good after them. So it's going well, and uh, it's, the arrow's pointing up towards playing. I mean, hopefully it does go right, and um, I'm out there Monday night. So it sounds like Tom Brady could get his favorite target back, RC, but any concerns either way for these Bucks against the Giants on Monday night? I mean, you have concerns. We've watched the New York Giants go on the road to Kansas City and give them all that they can handle in prime time. And so Daniel Jones and his defense and also a team coached by Joe Judge, uh, this team is going to play with effort. This team is going to play hard. And we've seen Tom Brady struggle the last two weeks with multiple turnovers in each of the last two games. And he's been without Rob Gronkowski. He's been without Antonio Brown. And I think those things are affecting them. Those are usually the matchups that this team has been able to win when Mike Evans or Chris Godwin has been bottled up or doubled and so it'll be interesting to see if having Gronk back if he does get an opportunity to play how much that helps Brady and how much more comfortable we could see him be I think this game could be tough I think it could be hard fought because of what's going on defensively for Tampa Bay as well but I am too scorned and I have seen it too many times to bet against Tom Brady I think that they find a way to win yeah, to that point, RC, it's actually been since 2002 that Tom Brady has even lost three consecutive games in the NFL. He had a four-game losing streak back in 2002. I can't do the exact math right now, but that's like almost 20 years ago, so it, it very rarely happens. <laughs> no. Let's get to Titans wide receiver A.J. Brown. This is a really interesting story this week, a powerful message about depression and suicide that he shared on social media last Friday where he admitted he had thoughts of taking his life last year. Brown said he felt like he didn't have hope, believe everything was going wrong for him yesterday he addressed why he chose to share this message I just wanted to come out and, and just try to just put that to rest you know uh, mental health is real um, just like physical health you know you take care of your body when you're sick just like when something's going on with you you need to get stuff off your chest you need to talk to someone seek professional help if it needs so uh, but uh, you got to take care of your brain just like you take care of your body too you know so find ways to 
uh, a safe safe place for you. Um, do the things you love, you know, you know, so enjoy every moment. You know, Marcus, I think so often we think that these athletes are invincible and that everything's just going right for them. So it really does make an impact when they share a message and use their platform in that way. Yeah, we cover the touchdowns, the great moments, the money, the contracts, but it doesn't dehumanize you to have all of those things. Publicly, you can look like it's all good, and then privately, guys are dealing with issues. I love the fact that the strength of these guys, and we're starting to acknowledge it as strength when they come out and speak about things that they're dealing with as people, because ultimately, behind those uniforms and those helmets, those are people. They deal with the same things, and I tell people all the time, it's relative in life. OK, for all of the people that show up on television, on cameras and you celebrate them, you applaud them. We get these awards, all of these things. People look at us on this show. We are dealing with the same thing everybody else is dealing with because we show up in front of this camera doesn't make us immune to things that happen in real life. So I'm proud of AJ, just like I was uh, with Calvin really taking time away from the game. But I want to make sure that people get this message. It is strength. It is more powerful to talk about the truth and the things that you're going through than to try to stand up in front of the public and fake like something else is going on. Yeah, very well said. It's okay to not be okay and to get the help that you need in all these facets of your life. we got more NFL Live coming your way. And coming up next, we dive into the AFC, the playoff rematch this Sunday between the Colts and Bills. Swagoo's going to tell us why this is the most important regular season game for taking Sunday in their matchup with Washington. I mean, you know, I'm going to take the Carolina Panthers, but it's not going to start with Cam. It's going to start with this defense. This defense we saw excel last week, albeit it was no D-Hop, it was no Kyler Murray, and it was Colt McCoy, but we saw some of the things we saw early on in the season, and then I expect Cam to bring that energy, to bring some of that mobility inside the pocket and watch Joe Brady use him, but I expect to see a little bit of P.J. Walker as well, and we all know there's no riverboat run without Cam Newton. You passed on him when you got the job, you passed on him when the quarterback got hurt, I think he'll want to show you he can still do it. Uh, so, in Bengals Raiders, uh, I've got the Bengals bouncing back after a rough stretch. And boy, does that just loss look bad now. Uh, after such a promising start to the season. Mostly because I think they match up well with Vegas and pass rush. Don't think Vegas is anyone who can stop Jamar Chase, quite frankly. And Joe Burrow will do a good job of navigating those, uh, those pass rushers that they've got in Vegas. I got Lamar, I got Lamar, I got Lamar. I do not expect him to have another outing like against the Miami <laughs> Dolphins. And then with the news of Khalil Mack being out, I think he's going to assert himself like we've seen him do for the majority of his career. Listen, this is a vendetta. Hate, hates losing. He's already told everybody in America he hates it. He's been chomping at the bit to get back on this field. The Chicago Bears are in for a phenomenal performance by Lamar Jackson. One of those reminders of why he that dude. Yeah, uh, you mentioned it, but Matt Nagy announced that Khalil Mack is going to have season-ending foot surgery. Disappointing for that Bears defense. How about the Colts <sighs> traveling to Buffalo on Sunday for a rematch of last year's wild card game where the Bills won their playoff game at home, the first one since 1996. The Colts will be bringing a different quarterback to town with Carson Wentz, but Indy's hoping their defense can keep the streak alive of a takeaway in 11 straight games. Indy's D is going to have its hands full trying to keep up with Josh Allen, right? He has a booming cannon of an arm and can't effectively use his mobility. He's found the end zone in a number of ways this season, pacing the league with seven touchdown passes from outside the pocket this year and on broken plays. Allen has held it together, leading all quarterbacks this season in touchdown passes on extended throws when under duress. So basically, he can do it all. But RC, what type of performance do we need to see from Josh Allen this week in order for them to get the win? We need to get away from roller coaster Josh, right? The Josh Allen who gives you the very highs, but you also have the peaks and the valleys of the lows. You want Josh Allen to give you some of the explosive plays without some of the explosive blunders, without the things that come along with trying to be special. Much like we saw when he played against Kansas City, he was able to give you the big plays, but he didn't make the mistakes. He didn't set that team back. When you're playing a team that's opportunistic, like the Colts, a team that plays sideline to sideline, the way the Indianapolis Colts do. 
do. You have to be smart about the way that you attack them, especially knowing yeah. they have a guy like Jonathan Taylor on the other side who can have ball control. I want to see Josh Allen show us why he's a dude that could be an MVP. I just don't want him to show us why yes. we were questioning that before last year. Mm. Yeah, Ryan, the, the simpler way of saying that is, can Josh Allen turn down the YOLO? Because the YOLO was high his first few years, and he brought it down last year. And, and every now and then, you, you see it coming out. You can see his, you know, those wheels turning. Um, I, I do have a concern in this game for Buffalo. I think Buffalo is the better team. But going back to the Jags' loss, yeah. the reason they lost was you, you got a little bit of that YOLO. But more importantly, the Bills' offensive line was banged up, and they suffered. Uh, yes. Now, yes. in this yes. game, uh, Spencer Brown, who plays on the right side, is is on the COVID list, and I don't know what their plan is going to be, whether or not they're going to have Daryl Williams move back to right tackle, whether or not Cody Ford, who has struggled, will play inside. But that, to me, is a potential challenge in this game because aside from Darius Leonard, the strength of this Colts defense is DeForest Buckner, who plays on this inside the inside. You need an answer for that if you're Buffalo yeah. because this team is really balanced, but to me, offensive line depth is their potential biggest Achilles heel, and it's one that we might see pop up in this particular game. Man, if Josh Allen is YOLO, so is Carson Wentz, right? You got two YOLO quarterbacks on both <laughs> sides. So, Marcus, oh, he's all YOLO you? all the time. <laughs> right, hey. right, he's never not YOLO. Carson, Marcus, played like you, you? Carson definitely played like you only die once, for sure. <laughs> Yo, Joe. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so, Marcus, how important is this game for Carson Wentz when you think about some of these things that we're talking yeah. about here for Indy? First, first of all, that conversation we just had, we are not the show to tell nobody to be not YOLO. Okay? We YOLO every day. <laughs> YOLO all the PMOT. time. <laughs> so we are, do not take our advice. All right? But the bottom line is, y'all, I believe outside of that final regular season game when Carson Wentz was with the Philadelphia Eagles and they needed to win that and beat the Dallas Cowboys to get in the playoffs, this is his most important regular season game of his career. This is why all of the things in the offseason transpired. This is why Frank Wright believed that Carson Wentz could come over to the Indianapolis Colts and take them to a level in which they hadn't been. Remember, this was a matchup in the playoffs last year with Phillip Rivers, and they came up mm. short, but they had multiple opportunities to win that game. Just if the Buffalo Bills continue to have gap integrity like our boy Dan Orlovsky showed us the other day, yeah. and Jonathan Taylor is not getting off, and Carson Wentz has to push this ball down the field 30-plus times, can he do it against the secondary? We just talked about how he plays on the edge, how he doesn't want to take sacks, doesn't want to throw the ball out of bounds. Do not, do not, I repeat, I repeat, Carson Wentz, do not YOLO in this game, man. Play with this structure. Hopefully the Indianapolis Colts can continue to assert themselves in their run game. I don't feel comfortable with it all in his hands, y'all. But this yeah. is one of his most important games of his career. You know, when Carson Wentz throws it 35-plus times, this team does not win. They're 0-4. When he throws it less than 35 times, they're 5-1. and So there's a recipe there for what he needs to do. It's just the it. the, I wasn't going to say it, L. Boogie. Somebody had to say it. All right, I'm glad you did. Let's get Phil Yates in here to get his DraftKings <laughs> daily fantasy lineup. Field, who made your roster this week? Laura, a bunch of guys that can run the damn ball, to quote my guy Swagoo. Woo! Let's start with Deontay Foreman. Perhaps the Titans' best running back right now. Ignore the Houston Texans uniform. That tells you just how new he is to Tennessee. Jeremy McNichols will be out on Sunday for the Titans, which means it's Deontay Foreman and Adrian Peterson as the next man up against the Houston Texans. They should have no issue running the football. Foreman actually led them in total snaps last week at running back. I like this spot here for him against Houston. Meanwhile, Dan Arnold has been super busy since he got traded to Jacksonville. Over his past three games, he has 17 catches, 195 yards, and 24 targets. The Jaguars are not getting enough out of their wide receivers other than Jamal Agnew right now, but they are getting plenty out of Dan Arnold, as always. They're probably going to throw the football a bunch against San Francisco on Sunday. And then one more here is Chris Godwin. This is a name that we all know, but Godwin, I think, is in a really good spot Monday night. Mike Evans should draw a James Bradbury shadow. This reminds me of what happened against New Orleans a few weeks ago when it was Mike Evans, Marshawn Lattimore. What did Chris Godwin do? He finished as wide receiver three on the week. He was exceptional. Love that value. 
especially watching him on Monday Night Football, of course, right here on ESPN. Other names of note here, Tua as my quarterback against the Jets. Alex Collins filling in once more for Chris Carson. And then some big money wide receivers in the form of Jamar Chase and Debo Samuel has just been absolutely exceptional for the 49ers throughout this entire season, Laura. Yeah, some sneaky good deals in there and also allowing you to still get some of those big names. If I were you, people out there, just copy Field's exact lineup and you'd do really well. we got a whole lot more coming your way on NFL Live. A massive on NFL Live. The Packers and Vikings face off in an NFC North showdown on Sunday. A matchup where game recognizes game when it comes to wide receivers. Devontae Adams and Justin Jefferson. Take a listen to Adams with some high praise for the second-year Minnesota receiver. I see a, a six-year vet when I when I watch him play. Last year, he already looked like he was been playing for four years at that point. So he's kind of aging like a like a dog right now. And I mean, in his purest form, because he's a dog out there. And I respect what he's doing. And it's really fun to watch. I truly hope that it doesn't look like what it's been looking like the past few weeks against us. But um, it's definitely fun to watch. That's such high praise from one of the best. And expect Adams and Jefferson to garner a ton of attention on Sunday. We could see DBs trying to get physical at the line of scrimmage, right? But beware, since the start of last season, Adams and Jefferson coincidentally ranked first and second in both catches and receiving yards respectively when pressed at the line of scrimmage, according to NFL Next Gen stats. So you may not want to do that, although what do you do, right? But Marcus, a big divisional game here on both sides. Which team has the most pressure to win? It's the Minnesota Vikings. And look, Mike Zimmer I absolutely needs to win this game. And I believe Aaron Jones is the second most important player. And I know what people are going to say, man, it's Aaron, it's Devontae, and then it's Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones has been the catalyst. A.J. Dillon has been the catalyst for what the Green Bay Packers have overcome with not having availability from receivers. And Aaron Rodgers is also dealing with a toe, people. So there are things that are working in the favor of the Minnesota Vikings. They have to have this divisional game. I truly believe this is a line of coverages. And then they asked Kenny Clark and Devondre Campbell to do their best up front and stop the run. And sometimes it works, but when they play sub packages, they actually allow opposing running backs to average five yards per carry, which is a lot. Uh, they have not played a rushing attack quite like Minnesota in recent weeks. And I actually think the Vikings are a bad matchup for them. As much as I love this defense and as improved as I think they are, I think we could see that weakness exposed in this game because of the particular strength of the Vikings. Yeah, it's interesting because we talked think Mina so is Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, RC. I'm sorry. I was just jumping in, just taking over the show. No, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I jumped in before you. You go. Oops. <laughs> well, all I was trying to say is I was just trying to agree with Mina. Like, th this is a, a, a tough matchup for the Green Bay Packers, and we've been applauding them and saying how well they played the last three weeks, especially with some of the adversity that they faced. But Dalvin Cook is a mm -hmm. top-tier running back. I think when you start questioning about who you would want on your team, you don't get through many names before you get to Dalvin Cook. And you know you're going to have to play and be alert on the outside with Thielen and Jefferson. And so this is a week that the Green Bay Packer defense gets to show us championship medal, gets to see if they were the help that Aaron Rodgers needed to win a championship. And I cannot wait to watch this whole thing unfold. When you have to stop a guy like Delvin Cook, but also be aware of the skilled players that the Minnesota Vikings have on the outside, that is extremely difficult to do from too high. And so I look forward to seeing how Joe Barry, the new defense coordinator, Green Bay Packers, deploys his assets. Yeah, I was so excited because I just wanted to tell you guys that Green Bay is top three in scoring defense and total <laughs> defense. Mm -hmm. so it was really worth me jumping in on you, Ryan. Smart line of position provided by IBM Watson. In Cowboys at Chiefs Sunday, Tyree Kill has a high projection of 34.8 fantasy points and a floor of eight points. IBM Watson's projected 34.8 ceiling is second amongst all players this week and only one-tenth of a, of a point behind Devontae Adams Devontae Adams facing off against the Vikings. Hill is the only player in the NFL with two games above 37 points this season. Laura, I know you guys are going to dive into this one, but we got to figure there are plenty of points to be had from both sides on Sunday. If you have Tyree killing your fantasy lineup, you can start smiling right now. 
Yeah, the defense is in this one going to be really interesting. And Mahomes may have his hands full against this Dallas defense to that point. It's risen to the occasion, posting its best defensive efficiency and QBR through nine games since 2006 while churning out takeaways. The big question, though, will the Cowboys change how they defend Mahomes and mix coverages, right? Dan Quinn's unit has utilized man coverage 62% of the time this season. That's second highest clip in the league. So, Mina, when you think about this there's so many good matchups right in this game but which specific matchup do you really have your eye on potentially determining the outcome okay i want everyone watching at home to watch marcus spears because what you're about to see is cognitive dissonance he's going to feel happy and sad at the same time sad because i believe the weakness of this dallas defense is stopping the run it really jumped out to me in the Denver game, Marcus. I, I think the Dallas defense is much improved. Um, I, but still, when I watch them, I see them uh, out of their fits occasionally. And I think it's you, you really saw Denver exploit that, frankly, when they went into their heavy sets. Uh, but you're going to be happy because I'm about to say Kansas the thing City you have been it. wanting me to say for so long, which is Kansas City. Run the damn ball. Run the damn ball against oh. this team. Because Hello. Yes. It, it yes. is, I think, yes, I, I, right. I really think Dallas is going to do everything possible to, to encourage them to do so. I think it's a matchup that can be exploited, and it's all about not the ability of Kansas City in this case, but the willingness to hand Daryl Williams the ball. Ooh. Yeah, we're still friends. We're still friends, MK, and I, I, I agree with you because we have to actually do our jobs and break down football, okay? <laughs> Here's my question for the Kansas City Chiefs. After watching the Las Vegas Raiders game, who will be their third option? It was Darrell Williams in that game, mm -hmm. and that kind of opened things up. And it wasn't just about pushing the ball down the field. They gave him the ball on screen game. To your point, Mina, they handed it off a little bit more to – Keep that defense honest for the Las Vegas Raiders. But I got a question. We know that you want to take away Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey, RC. Yeah. But when you get to that third option, how do you execute actually taking Tyreek and Travis away and seeing who else can beat you in on the back end? Well, well, I think, you, one, you do it by formation. There, there are different formations where these guys are featured, right? Where, where the placement of them at the number three receiver, if you're Tyreek Hill, that's where you see the deep overs, right? When you look at Travis Kelsey, when he's isolated by himself or when he's the guy in motion, he often becomes the number one option. And I think you'll have to adjust your defenses off of that. But Joe Witt, who is the defensive uh, secondary coach at Dallas now, was also the secondary coach at Atlanta week 16 last year when they, they lost to the Kansas City Chiefs 17-14. They played everything from a too high shell. They moved on the snap of the football, and I think we'll see some of that deployed this week. One thing I know they want to do, they want to make things simple. They want to play extremely fast, as you mentioned, the entire year. And the thing I will look for is where is number 11? The way that number 11, number 11 is, is deployed this game will be very important. Will he rush? Will he be the middle backer that's assigned to that third option, which may be Darrell Williams? I think he is the trump card in this game, and Dan Quinn has to use him to their advantage. Yeah, uh, Marcus, really fast. How would you use number 11? Uh, however, he going to make plays. But I would, I would, to, to RC's <laughs> point, he would, he, would hover, he would hover around the box for me. He would be yeah. the guy around yeah. the box yeah. because he is fast mm -hmm. enough to but, get back in coverage yes. and take away some of those over-the-top throws. But he would absolutely play mm -hmm. close to the line of scrimmage in this game. So, yeah, yeah I just want to – we're talking about Michael oh, go Parsons ahead. for those who don't know. And, again, this goes yes. back to what I was saying. You have to uh, take advantage of number 11, Michael Parsons' aggression. That is running, and then that is also the Chiefs' screen game, which you saw come back yeah. last week, and it felt so good. I want to see screens from Kansas City on top of runs. Good call, Mina. We're out here just talking about number 11. But, yes, Micah Parsons. All right, let's pick I'm the sorry. game, guys. Bad, we don't, have, we don't have a whole lot of time here, guys. So we're just going to go ahead and run through it. And I want to see everyone's picks pop up Dallas. on the screen. Because Laura. everybody except <laughs> everyone except me is picking the Cowboys. Yeah, you got dreads? Yeah, I got is some great. I don't know what, 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 what is, is going on there. I, honestly, honestly, like I'm, gonna have, to get, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to get. I'm gonna 
<laughs> Jamal. <laughs> the white dude wow. named Jamal. <laughs> when I show up on Monday hey, with hey, that exact RC, hair. RC. RC, <laughs> RC, <laughs> RC <laughs> L. Pickett, when you got a hair, just stop that room.